hello again. Sorry for the interruption. I was uh, just, I started the, an introduction on humanities lecture series and the purpose of the humanities lecture series. Uh, the overarching goal of the humanities lecture series to promote different facets of humanities to a general audience and provide perspectives that intersects other facets of human culture at large. In, uh, in bringing together thinkers from across disciplines, we aim to show how the humanities can both inform and shape our individual and collective responses to, to many challenges facing humanities in the 21st century and led us uh, forward with a new self-awareness, a shared sense of purpose and shared recognition of our vital connections to our multiple communities. Without further ado, here is Professor Tanya Douglas, please. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction, Ida. Um, the, what she mentioned about my talk being about the landscape of education, what drew me to education, uh, my biracial identity and critical race theory, uh, I realized after we published that bio that that is um, probably that would take about six hours. So I will be focusing uh, especially on critical race theory, but as it is manifested in these culture war wars that we are currently in. Um, but even just with that, I mean, really, I could I could speak for hours on this topic. It's been an intense focus um, of study and research uh, over the past year, but particularly over the last six months. And um, I'm kind of borderline obsessed with it, you could say, I'm very interested in it. And uh, literally, I mean, still researching and, and finding out new things today because this topic is so big and uh, has so many connections to so many different facets of American life, um, to our um, own individual lives, and it's complex. So I'm gonna do my best to keep this concise and um, try to provide some context and information so that we can hopefully have a discussion in the end. Um, and I do wanna invite you to unmute yourselves for the times when I um, am looking for some feedback. There are, are a few pieces in this where um, I'm gonna be inviting your, your commentary and I can't actually see the chat I tried. I'll see, it might work this time, but I couldn't see the chat when I had my uh, slides up. So um, hopefully you'll participate when I ask you to take off your, um, your mute buttons. I can see that some of my students um, have joined this call. So uh, they're gonna be on the hook definitely for participating. So things aren't silent when I ask for that. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and, and begin. All right, culture wars in America and the critical race theory debate. Um, so here's actually the very first opportunity to jump in. What is a culture war? Um, so if you want to unmute to just speak about what a culture, culture war is or what you believe our current culture war, plural wars, um, are about. Or we can have just a moment to, to just ponder on that. But if anyone wants to jump in with some thoughts on what is going on in the United States right now in terms of culture and what these images might represent. Looks like Dylan has his hand up. Yeah, um, I just think that in today's society in America, there's a lot of debate on, you know, like looking at the picture, like the LGBT community, religion, guns, um, Democrat, Republican, um, and also just like, also like just race, like black, white, Hispanic, Asian, like anything like that has to do with kind of just being different. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like now, cause America used to be like known for being a melting pot and that was just so good about it. And I think now we're kind of looking internally and like, we're kind of like looking for problems in the melting pot, you know? Absolutely, that was a that was a brilliant um, definition and explanation of what's going on right now. You really you hit some of the main pieces of what um, the contention is about. Thanks for that, Dylan. Um, I see Sreya. Yeah. Um, also, adding on, um, I think like 
mostly like culture war is it starts off like even like the small ages like from middle school itself um and it can like start off by something like very simple by saying oh you're different in mm -hmm. a sense like mm -hmm. um I'm talking especially about like race mm -hmm. and um if you just like body uh body like how you look and there's like a sense of normal and like um a standard of like how you should look like or should be in the world today and um it's just like it's too general uh, it's too general like the sense that everyone has to be a particular way and especially like female in my opinion since I'm a woman myself um you have to be like for example skinny or like um you like be uh lighter skin or what what whatnot so there are like these type of rule set rules I would say um which are in the world today absolutely that was brilliant um yeah it, it can start from things like that it can start in middle school we are always sort of representing the culture that we know that we've been brought up with um and you know absolutely in terms of expectations on what we should look like male and female and I think that's really exacerbated by social media so um, we're living in a very interesting, unique time where a lot of this is going on with that platform making it even bigger. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about that as well. Thanks for that. Um, Charlie. I just like to add that I think that there's a a, tr a culture war of truth almost. Mm -hmm. Yes, that well, thank you for that, because that's really what I'm gonna be getting into with this critical race theory debate, but um, definitely touching on the things that all of you mentioned. Thanks for that. Um, so I, I can't see anyone else, but I'm going to just carry on for interest of time. And I really do hope that I can fit everything in. If not, I hope that Ida invites me back at some point for part two, because there really are so many things that I'd love to get into. Um, history of culture wars. Um, uh, in the US, the term was coined in the 1920s and was used to describe conflicting priorities, values, and ideals between traditionalists or conservatives um, and progressivists or liberals. And a lot of it had to do with um, urban and, and rural, uh, you know, different differing values um, and modern society's rapid growth of industrialization and urbanization. So I've got these images here. This is sort of the time of the roaring 20s. Uh, a lot was changing, and uh, this is sort of when this term came into play. However, culture wars have happened, you know, in in human history, uh, you know, for you know, I would say decades, centuries, you know, longer than that. Really, pretty pretty much since we uh, became human beings and started to uh, align ourselves with certain tribes. As soon as there are differences and different expectations. Um, that's, you know, fertile ground for something like this. Um, so yes, and I put here that we can look back to, you know, a lot of the religious culture wars that many of us know of between Catholics and Protestants in England and in Ireland, um, you know, the culture camp in uh, Germany between Bismarck and the Catholic Pope. So we've had many examples of this before, and we've had many of these, a cycle of this happening in the United States as well. Um, little you know, graphic here around some of the things I feel are contributing to this culture war right now. Um, I need to move, sorry, this chat box here. So, you know, um, social media, obviously politics, our education system, what's lacking there, what needs to change there. Um, the American narrative, which I'm gonna be speaking about, the rapid change that we're seeing that many people are resisting um, wokeness, you know, we are in this, this era of awakening to many things, um, and fear is a really big one that's um, sort of stoking th these fires. Um, so here are just some images of some of the things that are, you know, going on right now. Um, we've got the sort of abortion debate here, um, gay marriage, here's the critical race theory issue. Uh, this here, I thought this one was interesting, but, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of um, assumptions and uh, issues that are occurring right now around religion and, uh, you know, questioning certain traditions and faiths and things like that. So those things are all still very, very present. Um, I like this image because, uh, you know, we, we're calling this a war, right? This isn't a war with weapons and guns and violence, at least not at this point, and let's hope it doesn't escalate to that. Uh, however, 
it's a war of, of words, of insults, of um, offense, you know, and, uh, and it's meant to hurt, you know, it's meant to marginalize um, in many ways, because we are not having conversations and listening to each other. Um, so this image really, to me, shows that even though it's not physical violence, you know, it's the whole sticks and stones may break my bones, but words, you know, words can be just as powerful, um, if not more, you know, when exacting this kind of um, vitriol. Um, so many equate this phenomenon right now um, with this sort of great awakening that they say happened around 2010, um, you know, which would have been a couple years after Obama was first um, elected. And uh, certain issues started to come up, social media platforms became more prolific, um, and uh, they, they're a big, big part of the engine of this. Um, so social media, right? So it helped to spread information, visuals, commentary, hate, love, solidarity, and division. Suddenly we were seeing this injustice, not just talking about it, right? So we're seeing now all sorts of videos and things that are captured and, and, and spread through social media, injustice around sexual harassment and, and rape, right? The Me Too movement was huge and one of the, you know, the first of its kind. Um, injustice toward the LGBTQ plus community, towards indigenous populations, um, injustice in, in regard to the environment. Um, BIPOC, obviously, on all levels, but particularly, I feel, to African Americans and Black men in terms of police shootings that were caught on film and uh, went viral, really bringing our attention to this issue. Um, the election of Barack Obama gave people who were sort of waking up this huge dose of hope, right? It symbolized that racial progress had finally been realized and to some that we could be done with the whole race problem. And Obama himself, and I, I completely love him, um, but he really added to this rhetoric of, you know, America is this wonderful, great country and we are this land of progress, um, sort of by emphasizing that his win represented the tenets of our constitution and that his story could have only really happened in America, right? Because America is just this land of the free and land of, you know, equality. Um, so this gave the impression that our country is fair and equal, right? People felt that MLK, um, Oprah, <laughs> Obama symbol symbolized our amazing racial progress and furthered this colorblind rhetoric, which really gained momentum in the aftermath of the civil rights uh, movement. And I'll speak more about that later. Um, so now we had this heightened sense of awareness um, and our eyes are now on each other. We're looking for evidence of where people's values lay, right? Voices become louder, particularly those on the extremes, right? So those that are kind of caught in the middle are feeling sort of pressure. Cancel culture is starting to really grow into a powerful force that spurs people um, and corporations into action for fear of criticism and social rejection. I'm sure you've seen many examples of this. Um, you know, not to mention losing their jobs, losing their reputation. So there's um, a real fear of being, you know, caught, um, you know, being racist or, you know, saying something racist or being inappropriate. Um, and I want to mention quickly that one of the biggest issues was that post-civil rights uh, movement era, the, being racist was really seen as like a moral sin. It became something that would make you be a bad person, right? It was really, it had a lot of, you know, evil connotations to it and nobody wanted to be labeled that. And there has been such a resistance against it that I feel, um, you know, the, the, this, this growing sort of denial over the, the smaller ways in which we are all contributing to this system get pushed to the side because if we're not being overtly racist, then that means that we're not racist and we want to do everything we can to claim, you know, that we are not that. So um, this awareness, this wokeness, this backlash comes in the form of Trump, Trumpism and, and mega. Um, I really love this. this is, I saw this on Facebook a couple of years ago, but I be believe in this and I feel like this explains some of what's going on right now. So I'll, I'll read it. Racism is dying. I know it looks like it's reinvigorated, but that's what happens when something is dying. It calls out for help and support. An ideology is alive and like all living things, it fights to stay alive, especially on its deathbed. Hold on, a new consciousness is coming. 
And I felt a lot of hope when I saw that. And I have to say that through my research into this, my, my sense of hope has definitely diminished some. I'm really trying to hang on to it. Some of the things I'm seeing right now are, are, are scary, you know, but I think that that's the point. And that's the point of this quote saying that, you know, when something that, you know, is foundational to our identity as a country, as a people is threatened, this is the sort of thing that we see. Um, a lot of what's happening right now around the critical race theory debate, um, you know, there, to me, there's a, a pre George Floyd and a post George Floyd time, right? Um, things really dramatically changed in many um, arenas due to all of the protests um, uh, over George Floyd's murder. This is a map here of all of the um, places worldwide, countries worldwide who joined in in solidarity for Black Lives Matter. Um, and this was, you know, by far the largest civil rights um, sort of movement that we have seen in terms of it being so global um, and impactful. So this is um, a big part of why we have this sort of backlash and, and the banning and the censorship and, and the things that we're seeing right now. Um, this map here, it shows the country, uh, the, sorry, the states in this country that have signed um, legislation and, and bills banning the teaching or even the discussion of critical race theory related you know, topics um, and certain things around gender and sexuality. So it's actually 17 at this point, 17 states have had it passed into law. You know, they've got it, they've got it done. We've got um, 23 around there states that are, it's pending. So they have proposed laws and there are about five that um, it, it didn't work. They tried, but um, it, they didn't pass. And, and then we have the few in gray there that um, haven't attempted and, you know, we'll see how things are with that. This here, you know, here we have some people, so, you know, supporting critical race theory here, um, saying that banning it is actually the perfect example of systemic racism, which, you know, really is true. Um, and then here at the bottom, there's somebody holding a sign in this one here saying that CRT is in, a, in and of itself racist, right? That it's, put, that the, you know, one of the biggest, uh, critiques around it is that it's divisive and that it is pitting people against each other and making people aware of their of their race. Um, these are just this is this was from the George Floyd uh, the the protest the BLM protests and I just I really love these images just showing um, I mean it, there was just a groundswell of you know solidarity and voices and coming together over this um, it was really an inspiring time. Looking back, it feels like it was a blip, you know, I think it got really um, trendy on the one hand. Um, they also, there was a lot of social pressure. If you weren't, you know, uh, supporting this movement, there was a lot of judgment around that. So a lot of people were, you know, got brought into it for either genuine reasons because they wanted to fight this injustice or because they felt that they needed to. And I've always felt like that's okay. Even if you're, you know, you're on the bandwagon with us, then, you know, um, you, maybe you'll get to understand more of where you, where you stand on it a little bit later, but, it, but you're still here. Many others, however, you know, really were conflicted about joining this, but, and, and stayed silent because they didn't want to be ridiculed. So there was a lot of pressure going on at this time. Um, here are some of the people against, you know, uh, critical race theory. And I just thought this one was interesting. You know, we are one race and it's funny, there's <laughs> in uh, brackets there, it says the human race in case people weren't clear, teach facts, not feelings. Um, you know, which I think is also kind of problematic. I mean, feelings, social, you know, emotional learning is extremely important um, to, to talk about and to teach in schools. So it, it's just so interesting how the divide is showing itself up in, in uh, education, where our views are becoming really polarized. Um, but the one here where it says we are one race, I feel like it's interesting that now we have this conversation around we shouldn't be uh, marginalizing people by race. We are all one race. This rhetoric was not here before, right? It was not here when, you know, a certain, certain communities in this country didn't feel threatened, right? That wasn't a priority. It is now. And I think that's interesting. Um, just a couple of quotes that I 
you know, speak to this, speak to culture wars in general, but, you know, can give some hope. Uh, if ever there was a house of civilization divided within itself and against itself, it is our own today. This is John Dewey. This would have been in the beginning of the 20th century. He was a sort of pioneer in education. Um, and then the human world is an open and unfinished system. And the same radical con contingency which threatens it with discord also rescues it from the inevitability of disorder and prevents us from despairing of it. So to me, that sort of speaks to these culture wars, this discord is sometimes necessary to move us to the next place that we need to go. Um, all right, the American narrative. So I, I'm listing here four reasons that I feel um, you know, this is going on right now. These are the things that are really contributing to this. So um, I call this the national glory story, right? We have this story about ourselves as Americans um, living in this exceptional country of, of liberty and equality, the American dream, um, progress, you know, that, you know, we've made some mistakes, but we're always, you know, moving towards progress. We um, have you know, high standards and values and with this empire really um, globally. Um, so here I have, yeah, historical and inherited beliefs and values, right? Of tradition, patriotism, um, you know, marching towards progress, American exceptionalism, uh, redemptionism. So this is this is sort of something that, that's coined by uh, an author that um, I'm, I'm reading a book of his right now and I don't have it in front of me, so I can't remember his name, but he talks about um, reconstructionism versus redemptionism, and that will be another lecture another time. Um, but also we're living in this time of colorblindness uh, and meritocracy, and meritocracy, what that's referring to is that no one should be given any edge or advantage based on race, right? So think affirmative action. Uh, it should be based on merit alone. So that's sort of, this is this story that we, um, we live. Um, and we've got some challenges to this narrative, right? So we've got progress on the one hand where we're starting to talk about this. We're starting to kind of pick it apart and look at it and say, hang on a minute. We're founded on these values of, you know, quality and liberty for everyone. But then we had hundreds of years of, of slavery and oppression and segregation. And this all these disparities now in terms of wealth and, and justice and, right? So what is going on? We are, we are seeking the truth right? We are, we are engaging in critical thinking debates and conversations, you know, and unfortunately not necessarily across the divide, but within our bubbles, it's a start. Uh, we're listening, there's wokeness, there's change, right? On the other hand, we have resistance, we have a lot of fear, uh, discomfort, uh, a need for tradition, uh, wanting to go back to the way things were, right? Uh, wanting to maintain this narrative of American glory, wanting to maintain security and power. And then I put zero sum in here. What that refers to is the, the idea that white people feel any advantages people of color might get will be at a, a cost or expense to them. Um, and this goes way back historically to certain ways in which poor white people were kind of pitted against um, freed slaves. And again, that's, that's, I don't have time to get into that right now, but um, this sort of zero sum mentality has a big uh, role to play in all of this. Uh, here's an image that I'd like you to take a look at. These uh, are two covers of the same book. Um, I am originally from Canada, Vancouver, BC, and I used to teach this book in my uh, English um, high school classroom when I was a high school teacher. Um, for many years. And when I moved to Bellingham, Washington, um, I looked for it because I was a high school teacher again over here and I couldn't find it anywhere um, because they had completely changed the, 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 the title and the cover. So I want you to just take a look at this for a moment and tell me, go ahead and unmute. You can tell me which one you feel is the Canadian version and which one is the American version. And you can put it in the chat too. I just can't see it right now, but I can see it later. Um, but if anyone wants to speak to this. And students of mine in, in my systemic, uh, you know, the, the black and white class, you can't say anything because you know already. Uh, Dylan. Uh, I think the one on the left is Canadian and the one on the I think the one on the right is Canadian, sorry, and the one on the left is uh, American. 
Okay, so the one on the right, someone knows my name is Canadian. Yes, that's right. And I American is the other one. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, do you, can you tell me why? Um, because because I too I I am from Canada as well, and oh. um, like in Canada, like like I've like you very very rarely you don't really talk about like you know from this is from my experience like like I never really heard the term Negroes until I came to America you know what mm. I mean and mm -hmm. I feel like um I feel like kind of like there's so like the, the history in America is so much deeper than the history in Canada that I think that um a term Negroes would be more kind of American uh-huh okay thank you thanks for that rationale Shreya yeah, um, he literally said the same thing, which I wanted to say. But um, yeah, I agree that the one on the left is um, the one from like America, since um, it's like a unique word choice, which like I believe Canada wouldn't have as much history as you said earlier. And um, the way like the black person is portrayed in the picture itself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it kind of like based on because um, I'm in high school right now. So we are learning about like black lives and like this is like the topic which we're going over right now and how like they were portrayed um, very like negatively and they were always compared like to the white and like like um, slaves and all regarding all of that. So um, yeah, and it's also okay. like physical features which they kind of like emphasized in my opinion, um, which yeah. is more, like, negative. Uh, towards right. like black people and yes okay Sorry. yeah <laughs> tanya ian Thank folk you. jubin they're just uh, and some students they said the left is canadian okay okay that the left is okay and frank yeah. and i'll just i'll take one more from franklin who has his hand up and then um and then we'll just i'll just i'll I'll reveal <laughs> okay. franklin so the reason why i think um the one on the right is canadian is because like in the upper top, it says winner of Commonwealth Writers Prize. Uh -huh. um, Commonwealth is something more associated with the um, with um, countries that are kind, they're like British colonies, right? Still like independent, Canada. like Australia and Canada. So mm -hmm. that's so that's what got me to it. So and, um, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. And um, and uh, there's like. Please correct me if this is false, but I heard Canadians are more polite than me and my other fellow Yankees, so I'm pretty <laughs> sure they wouldn't use the word Negroes. <laughs> so you were really right there. I think Canadians are, you know, we're known for being really nice and, you know, I, I think actually that can be a little problematic, to be honest. Again, another lecture. <laughs> I think it's really fascinating. Um, and you're right. Yeah, Commonwealth. The reason why that's there actually is because the author is Canadian. So this is a Canadian book. Um, so I, I'm just going to actually use that as a segue to say that that's unfortunate that that's there because that's misleading. It's actually the, the three of you, as much as I loved your analysis there, you are incorrect. Uh, it's the other way around. So the one on the left, the Book of Negroes, is the Canadian version. And that is the book I taught. Uh, looking for it here in the United States, couldn't find it anywhere. And then I come across this very soft, pastoral, you know, um, looks like it's whimsical, maybe a nice romantic, happy ending story called Someone Knows My Name. And it, to me, has a complete absence of the essence of what's on the left. And I and I know I, I probably would have said the same thing if I didn't know. Um, but then after thinking about it, it started to really make sense to me why this change is here. So now that you know that, that Someone knows my name is the American, and actually there is a little there's a there's a clue there um, where it says here's a little plug for um, Black Entertainment Television. That's an American thing. That's not a Canadian thing. So um, that kind of gives it away a little bit. But that you know you probably didn't notice that. But now that you know, right, the difference. Like we've got these the cap letters. We've got the intense gaze, right? We've got um, you know the, all of her blackness, right? Um, it, it it looks like just a completely different story. It looks serious. It looks like something that might make you uncomfortable. This one here looks like it could be the color purple, right? Which is a, you know, a, a narrative that we're all familiar with in the United States and isn't something very threatening. 
Um, but now that you know, if anyone, and I, I, we only have time for maybe one comment, but now that you know, or anyone who did guess that the other, that it was the other way around, is there any, do you have any thoughts? I just felt like, you know, the left one was a little bit more provocative, you know? Yeah, for sure. Franklin. Uh, that it was, um, it's kind of similar to what the last person said. I think, um, okay, so um, here's a, here's the thing, like, compared to other countries, the U.S. has, like, a bit of a higher age rating system for stuff to read or watch, broadly speaking. Mm. Like, I actually watched this um, anime show called Sonic X. The American mm -hmm. version is much, is a lot more childish so to speak and the um so it's a bit censored in a sense but if you watch like the french version and etc mm -hmm. it's not censored and still retains its original sound effects it's a lot more emotional than the right. american version that is fascinating actually i i would love to look into that yeah. Maybe I'll come amongst to other that. things i would like to talk about but you know time yeah Right. Yes, I know. It's, it's unfortunate we have so, so little time together right now, but um, I could spend a lot of time on this. And so, but I'll just, I'll wrap it up just by saying to me, this really represented the, uh, the discomfort and the fear that we feel in America about confronting our past, right? There, there is a deep, um, you know, we, we want to sort of, you know, put a nice pretty blanket over it, say that, yes, it's a blemish of our, our, of our past. We made some mistakes, but we've, we've gone past it. We've had all this progress. We've elected a black president. You know, things are, things are fine now. They're chill. Like we don't need to keep talking about this. You know what I mean? Um, I think that as soon as the Canadian or the American publishers saw this book that they needed to publish here, they probably freaked out, looked at it and said, no way. Um, this is going to make our American citizens really uncomfortable. It's probably not going to sell. So, I mean, there's there are lots of things, and this is just my conjecture, but these are the things that came up for me, and it, it's just very representative, really, of this critical race theory debate um, and the fear and discomfort that is pushing back yeah. against the teaching of our yeah. true history. Uh, and truth, right? yeah. yeah, that's actually the view I'm getting right now, because, like, I think... I I think Americans, including myself, a little bit have gone a little soft in that section. Like ah. even even outside a whole political racial thing, I think you can find this in a, a variety of other places. Like even like even video games of all places. Like even ah. the even the game age ratings are higher. Surprisingly, that's interesting. Yes. Well, you know what? You and I need to talk. So I'll I'll find out your contact information later because. Um, I think I, it's really fascinating to me how this comes up right along these different genres as well. Um, all right, moving on. So, so that so that was number one, the, the racial narrative. Number two, our political divide. Obviously, right now we are, um, I believe, uh, more divided than we have ever been historically. Um, and one of the reasons um, I was listening, this was actually an interview between Barack Obama and Trevor Noah um, from like two weeks ago, and. Obama talks about this vulnerability of Americans who are really susceptible to politicians who are offering them sort of a sense of peace and a return to traditional values, because there's this fear going on right now um, in response to how fast and rapid change has occurred, right? But, you know, all this progress, all this change, and especially when that change is making a certain community of people wrong right, about their lifestyle choices, about what they're doing, there's this, you know, fear and discomfort and resistance to it. So politicians that come and say, hey, I'm going to make things the way they were. We're going to go back to our traditional, you know, hardworking, you know, values. We're going to reject all this woke stuff, right? It, it makes it really easy to kind of get in there and, and um, sort of manipulate that. Also, the vulnerability, vulnerability, ability, sorry, of mothers. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, yes, you white, they say white suburban moms, right, who um, are up in arms because there is so much, you know, political 
rhetoric around the dangers of critical race theory, right? That critical race theory and the things they're talking about in school around gender and sexuality, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna make your white child feel bad about their race. They're gonna make them feel bad about themselves and call them an oppressor. Um, you know, little, little, you know, Sally might, you know, be exposed to something that makes her turn gay. You know, there's a lot of fear around what the curriculum might be doing, um, you know, as it's simply speaking about the truth of society and of our history, but it's something that we haven't had before and it's really terrifying people and, and politicians are banking on that. They're really using that to their advantage. Um, another thing is, you know, in terms of politics, progress is not linear. And I'm sure many of you can agree that where we're at right now, it feels almost like we're regressing, like we're going backwards. You know, you think about Roe v. Wade, think about, you know, voter suppression laws, um, book bans, I mean, book bannings, I can't believe that we're actually here. Um, but then there's progress too. So I put here like June, Juneteenth, for example, now we have Juneteenth, right? The, the, the date that, you know, slavery was abolished, which is actually not the actual date, but it was the date in, in, in this place in Texas. And that's the date they chose, but, uh, it, it, it's now a national holiday. It's being observed. However, a lot of people don't even understand what it is, right? They might know a, a little bit about it, but they don't know how to celebrate it. What are we supposed to do? Why? Because we're not taught this history. We don't have any context for it because um, especially now, if we're not even allowed to discuss this in school, right? So it's this kind of back and forth dance of progress, regression that keeps, you know, keeps us stuck. Um, so, and then yes, of course, the political fight to maintain this national narrative that we have, that we have, you know, maintain the hierarchy, maintain the supremacy that's there. Um, the, you know, politics and banning critical race theory, the 1619 project, Nicole Hannah Jones, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that uh, body of work, but it, it, it basically establishes the founding of our country in 1619 rather than 1776, because that's when the first slaves were brought to the United States and the institution of slavery is foundational, you know, in building this country. Um, but the, these politicians are using this as part of their political campaigns. When Trump announced that he's rerunning for president, it was one of the first things he said that, or he said, that, you know, the, one of the first things I'll do when I get into office is ban critical race theory and the 1619 project from our schools and stop this indoctrination and all of this, right? You know, applause, cheers, right? So they're really using this. Um, for for political advances, right? Um, and then you get media and politics together, you know, um, social media, Fox News, things like that. It's it's a pretty dangerous combination or a very powerful combination, I should say, in, in swaying voters' minds about things, especially when there's a threat, when they're saying your, your children are in danger, right? Um, you're gonna get people's attention. Uh, social media, the Tower of Babel. Um, I'll do this really quick, but the Tower of Babel, the parable of that is that, you know, humanity, when we were sort of unified and together, are we sort of felt, you know, so um, powerful and, um, you know, creative and unified that we could, we could create whatever we wanted. And we wanted to create this tower right up into heaven. And we felt that, you know, nothing could stop us. And God, who was very offended by the hubris of that, struck it down and basically scattered us all so that our languages and our modes of communication would be um, unintelligible to one another. We couldn't understand each other anymore. Um, and that's sort of the story used to say, you know, why we have all these different languages in the world. But if you think of it in this context, and this actually comes from an article I read by Jonathan Haidt um, called, uh, Is America Becoming More and More Stupid? And I'm sorry, I don't have the exact title of it, but it's a really fascinating article where he talks about this and that social media is basically just like this, right? It, it, it's created this sort of, this, this space where things can become so convoluted confused. We don't know really what's the truth and what isn't. Um, social media uh, social media also allows you to put on a persona, right? You can sort of, you're, you're hidden behind the screen. And I think it gives you more sort of power and agency to speak things that you wouldn't say to somebody face to face. Um, we've got, you know, it, 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 it's keeping us isolated, right? So we're, we're spending so much time on screens and, and getting all of our knowledge and communication through that rather than from each other. It's decreasing our, you know, attention span. We want these like quick blips of information because we want entertainment. So when it comes to like, you know, speaking, you know, longer dialogue around, you know, 
the truth of things, we might not have the patience for that, right? Uh, if there's something else more tempting there. So social media it has played a really instrumental role. And again, this is the platform where the, we have these extreme voices, right, of the culture war who are really drowning out the voices of the people in the middle and making them actually just too frustrated to even um, participate in the, in, in the fight or in, in this whole debate, right? Which again, is, is another problem. Uh, for, and, and finally, and now I'm gonna discuss critical race theory. It's our, uh, you know, the purpose um, of education and the lack of education. So questions for you, and we don't have time to discuss right now, but I just want you to think, what is the purpose of our education system? Why do we have schools, right? Uh, what's the purpose of social studies and history courses in particular? Who gets to decide which history matters and whose stories get told? Right. Uh, these days, there are certain places that have ethnic studies as an elective. I'm not sure if any of you have had that offered in your schools. I know California um, said they were going to actually move it from an elective to a requirement for graduation. I'm not sure if that's the state of things right now, but there's been so much pushback against that. Right. So we can't, you know, not only do we have an ethnic studies elective across the board, um, you know, or any kind of required course, which probably would be problematic because there'd be a lot of resistance around it. Um, we don't have it in our, you know, curriculum at all. We have Black History Month. Um, and, and now because of the bans on CRT and, and you know, the, the risk of getting fired and suspended, uh, this is, we, we, we are not really discussing these things at all out of fear. Um, Schools and school boards really historically have been the central battlefield of culture wars because schools are the one place that we have such a mix of race and gender of people, you know, and then uh, parents who are really concerned about how they're being shaped um, and quote unquote indoctrinated, right? So historically we've had a lot of, you know, certain political groups um, or, or, you know, community members trying to sway and control what gets taught in schools, right? So the purpose of schools, in my, in my opinion, really is to create, you know, citizens, American citizens with a very strong national identity, you know, and all of the things that that means. Um, and then, yes, CRT and, and the fears of, of this divisive curriculum. So this is interesting. So there's, there was some training at a college in Florida teaching teachers, right, how to kind of navigate this, this, all these bands and what's going on. And they said, look, you can teach Jim Crow, but you can't make the statement that it was implemented, implemented by white people, right, which, which is false. Of course it was. Um, you can talk about racism being an issue in this country, but you can't state that it's systemic or connected to laws, policies, or embedded in our society. You can discuss slavery, but you can't connect it to anything happening to African Americans today, right? So it's like this idea that, yeah, all these bad things happen, but they are so far in the past and we've had so much progress, we don't need to talk about this anymore. And we don't want to draw any connections to what's going on right now, because that could dismantle the system, right? Um, th there, there's a fear of um, now, what is it? What is it? The, 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 I wish I could remember the term right now. Oh, the great replacement theory. Um, there's a fear that minorities are going to take over, right? That, you know, Biden has elected, you know, more people of color to his cabinet and his office than any president previously. And th they're, they're calling us now, people of color and Black people, the majority minority, which makes no sense because they conflict with one another. Plus, it means really, to me, it's kind of offensive. It's like there are just more of the less than people. <laughs> um, they're fearing that, you know, their numbers in terms of like becoming sort of a, a, a numerative minority is going to give them less power um, in a democracy. And so that's part of why there is a pushback against democracy right now, um, you know, from, from that side of things. Um, this here where it says you can't use the word equity, that literally is a, a big buzzword that you can't use. Equity means giving um, everybody whatever kind of resources they need so that the, the, the playing field is, is equal, right? It's not trying to advance someone beyond someone and give that person more equality. It's simply just making it so that everybody has a seat at the table. So there, you know, if you can imagine that 
there are, are different heights of people and they're all trying to watch this, this baseball game. This is an image I've seen. They would give a box to the short one, you know, and, you know, glasses maybe to the one that can't see, um, you know, the one who's tall and has the, the perfect vision and, and, you know, perspective doesn't need anything, but the rest of them do to get to that same level, right? That's equity. And that's really important to discuss. But to say, to discuss it means it suggests, right, that America doesn't already have equality. And that's why it's a buzzword that's become uh, sort of um, banned. Um, okay, critical race theory. This is basically what it's about. It's a recognition that uh, race is a sociopolitical construct, right? It's not about biology. There's one race. Um, but racism, the belief of the superiority of one race over the other exists. It's embedded in our systems and institutions. It's codified in laws and policies and practices, right? We, we, we know this. Um, and critical race theory itself, it's, it, it's a niche area of study in only a handful of universities and law schools um, across the country. It is not being taught in K-12. So when I use critical race theory, um, when I'm speaking about that in K-12 education here, I'm using that because it's just, it, that's what everybody is calling it. It's become a catch-all for basically discussing race in, in any way that it is systemic, right? Um, that, it, that it's a problem, that we have white supremacy, white privileged, all of those things are, are you know, uh, banned under this label of CRT. Um, but what it, but, but CRT, I mean, CRT related concepts should be taught in schools. And again, this is what it is. So sorry, number three, uh, it reinforces a racial hierarchy, creates our current racialized society, um, and it bears primary, primary responsibility for reproducing um, racial uh, inequality, and I'm sorry, I have to just move this thing. Actually, I'm gonna just go to the next one. I can see we're running out of time. Oh, this was another image I wanted you to take a look at. And my students aren't allowed to chime in because they've seen this one too. Um, this was an engraving etched by William Blake in 1792 um, as cover art for a travelogue for, you know, this, this you know, um, person who went on this expedition and, you know, saw a lot of things around slavery and basically in, in, a, in a nutshell it, it's actually a very interesting journal um, but this was on the cover and I'm my question to you and maybe we can talk about this at the end if you were to give this engraving a title knowing that this is in 1792 um, what would you call it you know and, and really try to look at look at it deeply right look at the details um, look at the you know the eyes the gaze, the uh, extra things that are in there. Um, I don't want to point to anything right now, but um, hopefully we'll be able to come back to it. Um, but the reason it's here is because to me, this represents systemic racism, right? It's a system. Um, I'm going to have to go through some of this quickly, but essentially, you know, there, there are a lot of things that critical race theory does and doesn't, right? So the, the, on, on this side here, this is what this, all the opposers to it are afraid of, that it pits us against each other. It promotes the idea that young children are responsible for racial oppression, encourages children to be ashamed of their race. The aim is to divide the country um, and start a war. So these are the things that critical race theory has nothing to do with, but this is all based on fear. Um, what it does is grapples with the with the U.S.'s history with with uh, white supremacy, um, and it rejects the belief that we are in a post-racial society, right, where this stuff doesn't exist anymore. Um, it exists now um, in in some ways more than ever. And yes, of course, we've made amazing progress, but the fact that we are still stuck in this place in 2022, it, it really is problematic. And a big part of it is because we can't talk about these things. There's so much discomfort. Um, and denial around what's going on, that it's really difficult um, to penetrate. Um, I'm okay. I'm not going to go through all this. This is just a, this was this was a poll by voters. This is really small writing, so I kind of highlighted just a couple of things. Um, what people think about uh, critical race theory. So these are basically Democrats talking about what they think it is. So they feel that um, it should be taught in schools. It's simply telling the truth about slavery and systemic racism, um, raising awareness uh, for those who um, oppose it. They're saying that it's a study. Sorry, I got to not put this aside. A study and indoctrination of how to hate and remove white people from society. Uh, liberal New York Times crap about the entire history of the U.S. being founded on slavery and every single white person is responsible just by being white. 
uh, a farce, a Marxist proposal, just plain BS. So there, there's a lot of you know vitriol and hatred towards what what is assumed um, the, the the purpose of CRT, and it, it really is a shame that there's so much misunderstanding about it. Just the fact that critical race theory isn't even what is on the table in K to twelve schools to begin with, right? So there's a lot of confusion about this, but this is what confusion causes. It causes these totally polarized views about something that is actually trying to do something good in this case. Um, these are just some of the buzzwords um, that we aren't allowed to use in the classroom. So this is sort of how to identify it. Uh, many of these bans and laws that have been passed, passed uh, banning the discussion and teaching of this have um, implemented things like hotlines for parents um, and community members to kind of basically snitch on teachers and say, I heard them say this, or they said these words, right? And it works. There are so many parents and groups who have um, been able to successfully ban this stuff from their schools um, because schools are under a lot of um, pressure from the government uh, in terms of being defunded right? They can get put on sort of a, a warning list if they hear that some of their teachers are talking about this, and then um, they, they risk, you know, losing all their funding and literally needing to shut down their school. So there's a lot of, um, you know, even well-intentioned teachers and principals and administrators who, who want to teach the truth, who, who you know, are, are proponents of critical race theory, who still, um, out of fear of losing their jobs and livelihoods, you know, are going along with this ban. Um, this is something that was put out by um, his name, I think is Christopher Rufo, and he's been one of the biggest uh, opposers to critical race theory and has done like a ton of work galvanizing the public against it. So this is one of the things that he posted, make this issue, you know, critical race theory as public as possible, send an email to everybody, um, attach proof, um, you know, start a brush fire of angry parents. So then you can figure out who's on your side and we can get this stuff banned, right? And this is just one little thing. He has an entire website full of things like what to say if you're at you know, a school board meeting, uh, ways to defend yourself against, um, you know, anything that's too rhetorical or academic coming from the left, like it really is like a how to, um, to, to sort of combat this. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, I won't go into all of this, but just here on the right, it, it compares the um, anti integration sort of movement to these attacks on critical race theory, right, that both of them had the government body pushing policy policy and legislation, both of them had vocal parent led organizations that are, were really involved. Um, chaotic parent led protests and then laws introduced to cut off funds um, to schools and districts. Uh, here, this is interesting. This is just about Gen Zers, uh, uh, millennials, Gen X, and baby boomers, and what they think about. You know, this green is positive for critical race theory, uh, neutral, neutral, uh, no opinion, and then against. Um, and this is critical race theory. Here's socialism, capitalism, cancel culture. And I would love to spend more time talking about this. I think it's fascinating, but. Um, we'll save that for another another time. Uh, so this is basically what why these bans are out. This is sort of the the buzz phrase around um, sort of the foundational piece um, for the, the banning of critical race theory, um, saying that it teaches history that could cause discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any form of psych psycho psychological distress due to a student's race. So think about that. Who is this for? Do students of color are they going to feel discomfort? guilt and anguish about learning about their history. So uh, something to really think about. Um, there are three main, I think we're running out of time, but I'll you know just speak to this very briefly. There are three main arguments in opposition. Uh, one is that children are too young to learn about racism. Two, um, critical race theory is divisive, promotes group mentality. And three, that it's actually harmful to students of color. Um, Ida, you can just stop me whenever you want. Um, just and I'm not going to read all of this, but my my response. This actually comes from an article I wrote about this. But uh, you know, children of color learn about and experience race and racism every day. So obviously, this law is not meant for them. It's to protect white children. Um, parents of color are talking about it with them all the time. Um, our historical narrative has been created to protect white people from having to think about the blemish of slavery and the reality of racism at all then and now, right? Um, they don't think of themselves really as a race. They don't have to think about um, being racialized. That's something that people of color do. 
Um, and in, in my opinion, it's essential that young children become exposed to these ideas and ways to engage with them critically and creatively um, while they are forming their beliefs about themselves and around the world. If we start discussing these things in high school or college, right, most core beliefs and values have been set and it's just more difficult to shift, right? Obviously it needs to be about scaffolding, right? So that it's age appropriate education, but um, the ideas of privilege and oppression and identity, equal opportunities, um, are things that you absolutely can talk about with young children, and then it would just build in terms of, you know, the depth of understanding of these systems of oppression, but I think it's really vital. Um, divisive and group think, okay, we already think in groups, students um, are intelligent, they're already looking at each other for physical markers, things that separate them by interest, um, and of course, they're aware already of their racial and ethnic differences, right? The fear is that CRT is going to alert us to these differences. We know, right? To pretend that we don't have this already is really to underestimate the consciousness and awareness of our students um, as they navigate their social worlds. Their social worlds are more important to them really than anything else. They really do get it in ways that a lot of parents just don't understand. Um, so helping them develop the skills to understand these complexities and break down these barriers, right? Discussing how these, these systems work is absolutely what we should be doing um, in schools. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, yeah, harmful to students of color. I think students of color can really benefit from this, obviously. If, they're, if they are represented in the curriculum, if they feel like their identities are validated, right? Um, th this is something that will only help them. And if we're talking about these negative things and the challenges and things like that, that is really important too, because students of color need to understand um, those types of things moving into adulthood. Um, and I probably need to stop there. There's, there's a lot more, but... <laughs> Yeah, I guess uh, students in the chat box, some students, uh, Franklin, uh, Syria, and some students, they commented really well, and uh, maybe gonna, yeah. they want to share something with you. So uh, students, you can uh, unmute your uh, microphones and start uh, commenting, or if you have any questions, you can ask. I think we can have... Of course, we ran a little bit out of time, but uh, I can extend it 10 more minutes. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to ask our uh, um, guest speaker. And, and I'm also very happy to give my contact information or through Ida, if you have questions that you, you know, that might take a bit more time, I would be happy to answer them and, and engage in dialogue with you um, outside sure. of this. Yeah. Saraya, Franklin, they all have their hands up. Sure. Franklin, go for it. Oh uh, yeah, but remember when you said the things about Americans being more stupid? I think to oh, a oh, certain that's an article I was referring to. Oh uh, yeah, I actually article. think that may be um, at least a little true because, like, from what I learned from my mother, um, she said that in other countries like Europe, Russia, China, etc., um, education restrictions are a bit are uh, seem to be a lot higher because. If you fail a class or something, it's either going to kill your chances of finding a good job, university, whatever, later in your life. And number two is like um, about the, um, the, um, uh, the American and Canadian book difference thing. Yes. America has just gone a little soft ever since like somewhere around like post-World War II or during late World War II because like one of the reasons why we weren't able to take Berlin like the Russians to what I read is that we were a lot more scared of losing soldiers than the Russians did. Mm -hmm. And another reason is like more recently Afghanistan when, when, uh, when one of our military checkpoints was blown up, we mm -hmm. didn't even do anything to retaliate, which really irritated the hell out of me because we, <laughs> we were literally given the best reason to go in and light up some hajis, but we didn't. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, yeah, yeah. I, you and I need to talk outside of this this platform because I, you know, I think we'd have an interesting conversation. But... And and we didn't send our guys to help Ukrainians military just as we promised. Oh, Sending but, weapons yeah. don't go. I mean, that's a difficult one. I know it, it's a the, yeah a UN yeah. thing. Oh, I would love to talk to you more about this. I have a lot of opinions on that. Okay, um, I'll I give some that. people else a chance. Yeah. Okay, let's Syria, hear from I think Syria. Oh, well, I was thinking of Jeanette since she hasn't spoken. Go ahead. Yet. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, Jeanette. 
Tanya. I'm just thinking that, uh, you know, I'm a, a Polynesian um, Islander. Um, so basically, um, you know, where I'm from, everybody was the same and there was no issue with race. And I, I'm grateful for what the, uh, Dr. Mandela did, you know. Uh, at the same time, I wonder if it all started in the wrong foot. Because I, you know, it, uh, it, because in ancient time, that you're you're breaking up a bit, Jeanette. I'm sorry, I, I can't I can't hear all of what you're saying. Okay, so can you I write it in where... the chat? Can you put it in the chat? Sure. Um, okay, put it there, and I'll respond, and maybe we can go to Dylan and Sreya. Meanwhile, Tanya, please. Uh, just share your later at the end, share your email in the chat box with the students, yes. please. Yep, yeah. I'll do that right now. Yeah. Okay, Syria? Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm kind of talking like a little, so I, I haven't been doing well, but anyway, um, my opinion is that, um, like, I mean, especially when you're talking about schools, like, it's, uh, I believe that there are like a lot of stereotypes and like the ways like races, like for example, Asians by and how like uh, they should be or they should treat one another. And like um, when we're reading like a book, which is um, it's about Colson Whitehead um, ah, yeah. Underground Railroad. Yes. I don't know. And um, we're like kind of diving deep into like how um, white people, they're kind of like um, since birth, they were always given like this, um, uh, like this uh, opportunity of how uh, they can do whatever they want in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're like, uh, and slowly everyone kind of had to like follow. But now since like everyone has like a change in, and we can like share our own opinion, and especially it's um, it like people are able to like speak up now and have a voice um since the past few years which like it's really great um we're able to see a lot of changes but there are always like those certain people and uh, since I'm still in high school I'm kind of like just targeting in high school but I think it's like more related like broadly to how people just start um when they don't have any like connection towards that, they start like thinking as a trend is I would say, but it's like how um, they wouldn't take it seriously rather like make jokes of it and like it really mm -hmm. happened a lot like especially in um like since like the past few years like as I know a lot of people who are who have been coming out but there are others um always who like just um make fun in a sense and like they just try to like tease and which I really don't like and it's mm -hmm. um, also like reflecting on race is how for example, Asians, you're always like really good at studying, but it's really not like that. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, no, there's there's a lot of stereotypes that are going to take a long time to die, unfortunately. I exactly. think things are, yeah, inherited and embedded. And people who tease, I feel like that a lot of that comes from fear. Um, bullies, yeah. people who want to make other people feel bad, even what we're seeing right now, this pushback, it's coming from fear, yeah. right? And, and in a way it's because there's a fear that they are not going to win this exactly. um, and so they need to use power they need mm -hmm. to use you know political power and all of that right? right and that's why in a way that almost gives me hope because it, something is shifting and right. some it's something's got to move yeah. I want to make one really important distinction and point here, though, it's, I, and this is an irony that I think is really interesting. It's more these uh, anti-CRT people who are pointing at racism as being individual, and it's more people who are proponents of CRT who are pointing at racism being systemic. This is not about any one person being a bad or evil or you're racist, right? I mean, right. yes, we have examples of some extreme stuff, right? But I'm talking about, you know, your everyday person. This is a system. It's the right. system that none of us created, that we all inherited. And I really would love it if we could take away the sort of guilt and blame mm -hmm. about the sort of individual complicity because exactly. it's not about that right yeah, I was just talking about like yeah. the past in general like how there was like so much segregation but now like there's like a lot of people are coming together like like you were talking about colorblindness um and like but it's still like there's always that small percentage which is always right. there and still needs to change in the world 
Yeah, and it's going to, I really feel like that's going to happen. Colorblindness, I just want to say really quickly, is actually not a good thing. Um, to claim that one is colorblind is really kind of, it's a fallacy. First of all, that it suggests that we literally don't see these physical markers when we see each oh. other. Um, or, or secondly, that we see them, but we don't ascribe any, you know, characteristics to them. Both of those oh. things just aren't yeah, possible, I was like talking right? about how like everyone is kind of like together where yes, we right, right. different shape color in a sense, not like the other way around. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that, that gives me a lot of hope. Thank you for sharing that. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing that. Um, but yes, the colorblindness thing really, you know, it's something that we need to get over. It's well-intentioned to say, I don't see color, but in fact, it's actually really problematic. And, and what happens is when we don't acknowledge color, then we can't talk about it. We don't have the language to speak about race and what's going on if we're saying color just doesn't exist, right? So again, that's for another time, but, um, you know, yeah. Tanya, uh, could you uh, just read uh, Janet's my... comment? Or do you want oh, me there, to read yes, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, right. I see it here. Okay. So I, yeah, I felt we started um, all of this in the wrong foot culture wars happen within families as well, right? Absolutely. Teaching our kids to know the past without teaching the importance of love and forgiveness is not helpful in the long run. I completely agree. I believe the culture war happened before the beginning of America. If we look into every country where we will find inequality as per humanity existed. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. I really do. And, and I, we see these culture wars erupting in, in very intimate spaces in our families and our relationships um, on large scale platforms. And there is a history from it. it. It's coming from, you know, yes, absolutely before America became a country. This is something that um, it's a phenomenon of human nature um, that we've had for a long time. Thank you for that, Jeanette. You're welcome. Uh, so Dylan and Rebecca, I know Dylan, you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, yeah, I just want to first off say thank you for the time and the um, PowerPoint you shared. And um, I just want to say like something real quick. So like, I like being black, like I've had like, you know, friends who are white and Hispanic and Middle Eastern and stuff. And I think the tricky thing about being or talking about racism is like, you don't want to like kind of build a resentment towards white people or anybody else who was in a position of power mm -hmm. and um right. i think that like because sometimes like when like you hear like the black community talk about racism and um and like like how it was in the slavery days like there's like you can he you can hear like the pain and you can hear like the the um the 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 realness in it and some and some of it, like you can hear them, like some black people, they say they hate white people, they say they hate this, they hate that. So right. I do, I can see where like you don't want to talk about it, but it's like you can't, you can't like dismiss what happened. You know what I mean? Like you can't just ignore like right. four hundred years of history. Right. You can't just like erase it but, just but, so like yeah. So so like I I feel like personally like I feel like. I feel like the more we talk about it and the more like things are like like said and uh, things are shared like I feel like like the better we will get as a society because like well one thing my coach always says is communication kills confusion right and there's a lot of people mm. who are confused and just don't talk about it right so they sit with these ideas yeah. that they're scared to talk about because they don't want to seem racist or they don't want to seem yes. like or get canceled so they just don't talk about it so yeah. i feel like if you like if we have open communication and kids learn it and they can see well yeah well my ancestors yeah they were wrong but i'm not like i i don't like i'm not them you know like they're not them so like right. i feel like the more we talk about it the better it would get and yeah i mean like yeah, so yeah. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I so agree with you. That I, to me, that is the answer. Um, finding ways to do it in a way that isn't going to push the other person aside. Finding yeah. ways to find our common ground, right? We all have something in common. We all have similar values and goals, right? But it's like as soon as we feel threatened or judged by somebody, we want to retreat, right? 
And that is, that's what, that's the problem with like things like cancel culture. Cancel culture has done some good things, but the thing is that the pendulum has swung so far, it needs to balance itself out because what it's doing is it's pushing people away who are way too afraid to have these conversations for fear that they're going to say something wrong. And, you know, we, we, we have to be able to talk about this and take out the personal right? Take away our assumptions and personal and just talk and listen to the other person's perspective. I mean, how we get there, I don't, I, I have some ideas, but I really don't know, right? But, but to me, you're, you're absolutely right. I think that is absolutely the solution. And we are not doing that right now. We're not talking. Yeah. Right? Or we're talking in ways that's, that's just almost contributing more confusion, you know, to what's going on. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dylan. And thanks for all of your comments um, on this. Appreciate it. No problem. Hey, Rebecca. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, as my phone starts ringing here. Um, I mostly just wanted to make a comment. I'm an older person, so I have kind of a different perspective. Yes. I grew up, um, I was born in 1958, so I'm 64. Okay. And I'm enjoying all my humanities classes. I see my professor, Dr. Kashani there. Um, <laughs> when I was in junior high school, they aired Alex Haley's film, you know, the TV series, Roots. Yes. Roots. Remember that. Mm -hmm. I remember feeling bad about all of it, but not to mm -hmm. the degree that people talk about today feeling bad. And I wonder when did Americans get so soft that we cannot face or have a reckoning with our past so mm -hmm. we can move forward mm -hmm. to a better mm -hmm. future? What is mm -hmm. what has gone so mm -hmm. wrong? Although I am heartened by your comment at the very beginning that you talk about. Um, that this may actually be the end of these problems. Like it's, it's on its last yes. leg, so it's got to rear its ugly head. I, I actually do agree with that. I, I sense that, so I'm, I'm hopeful in that regard. But I just wonder where in the last maybe what, 20, 30 years did Americans get so yeah. soft that we can't yeah. face these things, learn from them and deal. I, I agree with Dylan. The more we talk about things, the mm -hmm. more we open mm -hmm. up. I think that's, that's for the best. And by the way, this has been a wonderful Absolutely. picture. I was glad that I, I was able to attend it. Oh, thank you so much, Rebecca. And you really ask a great question, like what has happened in the last 30 years? Why are we here? We used to be able to talk about these things more comfortably. And now I, I think there's a lot of answers to that. I think a lot of it has to do with, with social media and these bubbles that we're in that have now created these identities and personas and these assumptions we have of the other, right? So we automatically assume when we engage with other people of, from other, you know, po political, whatever the other means, we come at it with these assumptions we come at it almost with these defenses ready to almost argue because we are so divided right now um, that it doesn't take much to light those fires. We've become very fragile, I guess, in that way. And, and it's not just in terms of this, these issues around, you know, race and whatnot. If you, if you think about, for example, how many, uh, there's a great, there's a great cartoon. I almost put it up, but the, it shows 1960s, these parents who are really getting mad at the kid with the report card saying, how come you have an F? And then it zooms to the 2000s and it's the same thing, but the parents are getting mad at the teacher. Things have totally changed where we are like wrapping ourselves up in bubble wrap to like to protect all of our vulnerabilities. And we're just ready to like sue anybody who's going to cross it. So I, I think that, there, that the, the answer is complicated. I think there are a lot of reasons that we have just become so, you know, we want to defend everything and we want, you know, but it's a lot. I love the question, though. I really do appreciate you bringing that up and bringing up, you know, Alex Haley and Roots and, and, and those in that perspective. And yes, I think dialogue absolutely is essential. I think it's harder than ever right now to get there. But that is exactly what we need to do. And we need to have patience. And when somebody says something that, you know, might be insulting or whatever, just wait it out. Hang on, you know, keep talking. Don't let that shut it down. Don't push them away. Right. Um, that, that, that to me is the solution. Yeah, I think Thank it's you. very interesting what you just said. I'll just make this final comment. It's like everybody I knew yeah. was watching Roots. We talked about it. Yeah. And yeah. I went to yeah. a high school that was, we were busing kids up from Redwood City. I went to Carlmont High School in San Mateo, um, the San Mateo County area. And we, we talked to each other. Yeah, there was some dissension mm -hmm. and difficulty and tension, but not like what it is today. And I, that's why I keep wondering what happened? Yeah. When did what when happened? did these is things? It, yeah. Everybody's so sensitive. Is is like narcissism just the 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 day rigueur? I I don't know. But that that is interesting. It, something to think about. I just that's part of it. Over ourselves and move forward. 
Yes, I mean, it's excellent. I would love like Tony's and Ida's, you know, opinion on this or anybody's. I mean, that really is a million dollar question. What happens, you know? And, and you know, yes, the answer is complex, but if anyone wants to chime in on that, um, I know uh, Falk has, uh, you've got your hand up too, though. So, so. Yeah, actually, I would like to chime in on this precisely. Thank you so much for your lecture. It's been such a pleasure listening to that. Um, uh, thank you for, oh. for being here. And, and, and I hope there is going to be a second part uh, for the Humanities Lecture. Me too. Which we participate. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, so kind of to uh, piggyback on the last speaker and also on Dylan, um, you know, I think the issue is here, what is wrong with discomfort? That is, I, for me, the core question. I think yeah. that, you know, we need to practice to be in discomfort. The, as you mentioned, you know, these histories that we have inherited, we didn't start it, but we are right. beneficiaries or participants mm -hmm. in this history. And therefore, you know, we need to be able to sit in that discomfort with each other, not to... Yeah not to you know move into separate rooms but to actually yes. tolerate discomfort yes. Yes. in yes. feeling our common human bonds right right that there is nothing wrong with this this is something to be celebrated rather than it is. Feel absolutely what is it that we are so afraid of with that discomfort is essential for growth is it not I mean, we, we really can't expand beyond our, our horizons and take on new knowledge without taking risks. We won't take those risks if we're too afraid, if we're so attached to our comfort. And that is a huge problem that parents are, are kind of getting all in there and saying, no, you can't make my child feel this or feel this or feel that. Uh, they, they must in order to evolve into critical thinkers, right? Who, who are gonna be able to be agents of change in the world. The, you are absolutely right, the discomfort. There's a great quote that says, uh, it says, I had to make you uncomfortable or else you never would have moved. Love the universe. It's like, I saw it you know, on social media. And I really love that. It's like, we, we, we need to be pushed and, and students themselves, children might not do it in and of themselves. We, they need us to help them do it. They, of course they wanna be comfortable. But it really, I do agree, it's necessary, but there's so much fear around it. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, what yeah. do you think, I, I can, we can keep talking, I, I'm gonna let you. Yeah, the uh, conversation is really well. I don't want to stop it because it's really uh, serious. And as Falk mentioned, uh, we would love to have the uh, part two of this uh, conversation. And uh, yes. just talking about the discomfort, uh, the, yeah, the book cover, oh, the, yes. the left one, because they the right. thought, okay, Americans like to sugarcoat everything, and then they don't want that, so that's why they softened it, feminized it for the yes. American version, and they thought it's not a really good uh, selling point to have this really harsh reality on the front, so that's nice, really nice. that. Yeah. So uh, Syria has a question. Then I think nobody is having a question. You may There's check the uh, comment box as well. At yeah, the end. I and, just wanted to. Yeah. yeah, the comment here from Jack saying a main reason why I think we are uncomfortable creating discussion is from the stigma stigmatization. I'm sorry of being wrong or making mistakes, especially K to twelve, that prevent vulnerable conversations from being had. <laughs> Absolutely, like you you hit the nail on the head right there. We are very afraid of failure. We're really uh, afraid of that making us be bad or wrong, um, especially in school with all the pressures that there, you know, there are. So that's a really important comment. We have to soften what failure looks like in our classrooms, right? We need to almost encourage it as an opportunity to go, oh, hey, okay, I know what those limitations are. I'm gonna learn from that. And now I'm gonna move ahead and grow. Um, so that, that's great. Thank you for sharing that, Jax. And, and I haven't, I haven't had time to read all of these. Can I, will these be saved in the recording, Ida? Yes, not chat? in the recording, but I can, uh, I'll you save the chat, chat okay. as well. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I save the chat, yeah. Then I can send it to you or uh, students if they want to, they can just uh, directly contact you with that. Yes, I, I, I absolutely invite that. Thank you. I think Dr. Um, Kashani has a question. Yes, Dr. Kashani. Um, well, I'll keep my, my statement brief. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Douglas, I, I want to thank you for a riveting presentation. 
uh, I think everyone will agree with me here, or those who are left, that we learned something today and we have new lenses to use to look at this whole notion of what to do about racism in America and all the rest of it. And hopefully you'll come back. Yes. Uh, perhaps Ida will invite you back for, uh, for part two of, of this conversation, which can easily turn into series of conversations and so forth. Um, I think that would be wonderful, thing, yeah. Yeah, one thing I wanted to mention is that the, uh, the history of, because people are wondering, Rebecca, I think, made the point that when she was going to high school, people were discussing like, roots and programs and, and kids were being bused into the school. There was conversations between kids of different socioeconomic statuses yes. and uh, the intersectionality uh, was uh, affirmed uh, then. But right. today we have almost a 180 degree uh, difference yeah. in that kind of interaction between folks, given the, uh, I would say the triumph of anti-intellectualism, uh, which in and of itself can open a new uh, window towards a long series of conversations of why uh, we have embraced anti-intellectualism in this country. Part of it has to do with our system of education, right. which actually is designed to turn people into great efficient functionaries, but less thinking Mm -hmm. and not critical thinkers. Um, efficiency for the system, but not thinking and engaged citizen. That's, those are two of the objectives of right. the education system. Again, thank you so much for taking the time and the extra time. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for, for this opportunity, really. It's been, it's been amazing. And, uh, and I really do hope we can continue. I love the, the, the conversation, really, that's, that's coming up here. Um, th this is what it's all about, really. Um, Sreya. Um, sorry, I'm just going to make my comment really quick, but um, it's like going back to what, um, I'm sorry for pronouncing name wrong, like Falk, Common. Um, right. right uh, what they were talking about, it was like restricting, <laughs> um, restricting parents. Uh, I mean, what I like, how we're like students especially today from like k to 12 like we're really restricted to like what we learn and i mean at least like from like how i'm brought up my parents don't usually bring up like anything related to like violence or like um any wrong thing quote unquote um which they believe is wrong like it's just they want to be rooted to like how they were um how how their path was paved and like we can't it's just like a narrow path which we have to go through um right, this right. World. and how like they always want to give the good for us but we end up also learning like other things which sometimes like this is how like also relations relationships also get teared apart in my opinion where we don't share like some parts like of what we learn um in our daily life from not not our parents but like from an outside source and then once they learn that we know about it, it's kind of like, oh, why didn't you tell us this? And it kind of like goes on like this ongoing spiral, in my opinion. And um, yeah, um. it's just, there's like a way of how every parent or like every person, they always have like this one track mind where they always want to teach other people their perspective, but um, it's kind of like hard and it's no one wants to feel like the discomfort of like them being wrong in a sense. Right, right, of course. And, and being being a parent is hard, I tell you. I've, right. got two children. <laughs> I've got a 23 year old daughter and a 15 year old son. And I tell you, um, it, it is hard because you want to be that role model who, right. who knows, right? And of course, when they're young, they idolize you. You're, you're, you're God <laughs> to them, really. Um, but then, you know, they start to see... So for me, my philosophy is, you know, do as I say, not as I do. I mean, I've made all sorts of mistakes in my life, um, but but with my children, we really talk very honestly and frankly about everything. Yeah, that's Nothing's off the table, um, you know, and so there's a lot of, you know, trust between us and, and a lot of like liberty in our house to do whatever and be, right. be ourselves. I know that's not that common though. I do understand yeah. that, that, that can be really um, uncomfortable. And I think being a parent, especially now, it, it is hard. It's confusing. Mm -hmm. um, to what degree do you hold on and protect? Exactly. And, and 
or just let them go and, and experience, right? Um, and, and one thing I know for sure is you can tell someone all about something in terms of warning them against something, they'll never really understand it unless they take that chance themselves. Exactly. I'm not saying something really dangerous, I'm just saying we need to let go mm-hmm. and allow our children to experience yeah. because they can't do it vicariously through us. Exactly. Yeah, you my know? uncle, he always says like time heals like everything and like teaches everything it's like time is like the best teacher for everyone yeah. regardless of like what generation you're born in it's uh-huh. just like time is like a key factor where like you just learn and adapt to different situations mm-hmm. based like on the time you live on earth kind of. mm, I like that I like that time sure is important thank you Straya. yeah you. speaking of time uh, I think- <laughs> No serious thought, nobody. Thank you so much, Tanya. Oh, this yes. was a great honor and thank you. Great conversation and discussion and lecture. Uh, we will definitely have you for the second part and maybe we turn it into a panel discussion and uh, more uh, to about the sensitive issue in a sensitive time like this. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Thank you, everybody, thank you. students, thank you. colleagues, everyone. I appreciate your participants and everything. Thank you, Tanya, again. Absolutely. And everybody have a nice evening.